Um, we're going to continue our study about about Joseph, and the, the subtitle for this week is called "Be at Ease." Be at ease. Remember, God said He is always at hand, right? So if you stick your hand out, that's how close God is. Now, I've heard some preachers say, well, you've got to realize that God's that close all the time, and that means you're supposed to be acting right and doing right and trying real hard to be good. But that's not what we teach here at the crossing, because the harder we try, the harder things get. Isn't that true? Paul said in Romans 7, the more I try, the more evil is there with me. The harder I try, the harder it is to quit. So what, we've, what we're trying to do is realize when we need God, He's right there. He's that close all the time. He's always at hand. He's never going to be far. He still says He's going to work everything for the good of those who love Him. Everything. So even in difficult times, we've talked about it with Joseph for weeks now, even when he was falsely accused, even when he was in prison, Joseph had his focus on the eternal picture. God's doing something. I don't understand it, but I'm trusting Him in the middle of this madness. You know the Bible says to, to be thankful in all circumstances. Not for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. No matter where you are, God says you can be thankful. Well, how can we be thankful if we think God's punishing us? If we think we have a, a punishing, vengeful, wrathful God, how would we be thankful for that? When we realize there's a loving God who is trying to work things for our good, then it's a lot easier to be thankful. When we get the eternal mindset that says, wait a minute, this right here, I don't like being in. But I'm trusting God because He said He's working everything for my good. And I might not like going through this little journey, but in the end, I know God's going to be good. I know He's going to work something. He promised it to me. He said He'll never leave me or forsake me. He'll always meet my needs. <laughs> I don't know how else, how more simple it could be put other than this. He who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So if you ask yourself the question just with that one statement, he who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So ask yourself this, who started this work? Hey, if he says never more, I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> he who started the work in you, who's, whose job is it to start that work? He who started the work in you will be faithful to complete it. it his, he started it, and he's going to complete it. So what's my job? Well, what Jesus said, this is the work of God. Believe on the one whom he has sent. Trust in what God said he's done for you through his son. He's made a provision for you. He's wiped the slate clean. He's made you a brand new creation. You can trust Him. What happens and what gets in our way is this. Guilt. Guilt. And then your first two blanks on your study sheet, the first one says guilt. The second one says grace. But in between there are very important words. Guilt is the destroyer of grace. Guilt is the destroyer of grace. You remember Jesus came and He took away all of our guilt and shame? He took away all our resentment. I think God's calling. This must be God. Available, un ID unavailable. I have to catch it later. <laughs> unresolved guilt always magnifies anxiety on your study sheet. Unresolved guilt always magnifies anxiety. Did you ever get all freaked out about something going to catch up with you one day? There's still an issue in my past that, that is that haunts me. It doesn't really ruin my life anymore because I know God and I have dealt with it. But someday I'm going to run into this somebody that I hurt. Someday I feel like I'm going to have to go face to face with this one man and say, I was the one. I was the one. And are you ready for that and are you prepared to do that? I was speaking with somebody yesterday who said he's been very ashamed of the way he's been living all of his life and he didn't know how to deal with it with some of his friends and some of his clients that he deals with. But my Bible says this, Jesus Christ died on the cross to take my guilt and my shame. And it also says later on, as I mature as a Christian, I can speak with openness of face. I don't have to be ashamed of my past because guess what? My past is history. It's gone. And that's who I was, but it's not who I am. God said He's made me a brand new creation who's holy and without blame before Him in love. Well, wait a minute. 
how come I still have to keep all these things in the back of my mind and keep I keep a little scorecard going whether I was good or whether I was bad because my nature is how am I going to be good without trying how am I going to be good and, and how can I prove and how can I gain these fruits of the spirit how can I have joy how can I love others how can I find peace how can I have patience and this is what God told me just this past Tuesday in jail it was a great revelation See, we go out and we try and earn or try to bear fruits for the Spirit. Well, I want to I want to go love people. Well, of course you do, because you wanted love and you know how good it feels. But I'll tell you this. This is what I heard Tuesday. There's not a plant or an animal in the world that bears fruit until after it matures. There's going to be a time of maturing, number one. Number two, those plants don't strive and try to bear fruit. That's a work of God. See, the fruits of the Spirit are a gift of God. Those are going to come in time as you mature. You can't try to have patience. God will work patience in your life. You can't try to love others until you fully receive God's love. You can't try to have peace until you receive the peace of God. Does that make sense? So our job isn't to strive and try like we think it is. What do I got to do to be a good Christian? What do I got to do to find peace? I've actually had people tell me, and it really confused me, when I first got saved I had this great joy. And a few years down the line you kind of get complacent and you wonder where that great joy went. Is it just me? I think everybody's been through that. You have that little emotional high when you first get saved and you feel the love of God. And it is a warming, comforting feeling. And then down the line you start feeling like, well, maybe I'm really not saved. Maybe I don't have that joy anymore. Maybe something's wrong. And you'll have well-meaning Christians come up to you and say, well, brother, what were you doing when you had that great joy? Well, I was, I was really close to God and I was just hungry for everything and I was going to every Bible study there was. Well, that's what you're supposed to do then. You have to do that if you want to get close to God again. But that's not necessarily what I'm finding out to be true because God says it's not about what I do, it's about what He's doing. What I've got to do is get back to the trust issue. Who am I really trusting for my joy and my happiness? And am I striving for happiness, which happens from happenings, or am I really finding peace? Because what I really wanted was peace. But we strive for happiness, don't we? And when we don't get happy, we just want to feel good again. And that's a lust of the flesh. Any strong emotion is a lust of the flesh. If you find yourself in a position where I just want to feel good, you're in a dangerous spot. You're in a dangerous spot. And it's going to take this, the renewing of the mind. Cognitive restructuring. Wait a minute, that's not what God says I'm about. God says I'm a brand new creation. If I read it in Ephesians, He's already blessed me with all spiritual blessings. He's already made known to me the mystery of His will. He doesn't even call me a servant. He calls me a friend. That's in the book of John 15. He said, I no longer call you servant. You're a friend. A servant doesn't know his master's will. But you're a friend and you know my will and I've made known to you the will of my Father. And until we get a hold of that truth for ourselves, we're never going to be free. Because Jesus died to set us free. What we do is we put ourselves into religious bondage. Well, what do I have to do next? And then what do I have to do? And which hoop do I have to jump through next? And what you'll find is well-meaning Christians trying to tell you to jump through hoops. And when you get through that hoop, they're going to lift it a little higher. And they might even get a little higher and then make it a little smaller. And when you finally get through that one, they'll light it on fire for you. Now try it. And when you measure up to our man-made standards, then you can be one of us. Praise God and hallelujah.